Hello, I'm Eric Ford and this is part five of six and we're talking about strategic control and in particular we're going to talk about governance now. And by governance we largely mean the board of directors or the people that oversee public uh, organizations or private for that matter but mostly public. Uh, so what is the role of corporate governance in modern society? Well, corporations were formed to be entities other than humans that exist, and it's a rather interesting phenomena, the anthropomorphizing or uh, anthropomorphosis of corporations to have rights unto themselves in much the way we think about people having rights. And what does that mean for society? Well, we set up corporations in large part to organize people with disparate interests on a common format, as well as to manage the risk of those principles. We'll get into that in just a minute. But what is the governance element? Well, this is how we define the relationship among the various participants, determining the direction and how the performance of the corporation is supposed to be assessed. Uh, the primary participants are the shareholders or the owners. Okay, These are the people who actually own the company, the management, and the board of directors. As I mentioned earlier, the corporation is a mechanism created to allow different parties to contribute capital, expertise, etc. Uh, and it's for the benefit of everybody. Uh, does anybody know what state is probably best known for incorporating organizations? It might surprise you. It's not intuitively clear why this state uh, may be this. Uh, it's Delaware, in fact. You'll see many large U.S. corporations are incorporated in Delaware. Uh, we also see people who will often incorporate offshore in order to avoid some of the tax systems of the United States, etc. A large part of how the board works is defined by something called principal agency theory. Uh, I would sincerely hope that people who are watching this have uh, had an opportunity to take an economics course where a lot of this rose out of the field of economics and they talk about it at some great length. Uh, as the theory that dominates how we think about behavior in organizations. Uh, the principals are the people who are owners of the firm, the stockholders in this case. Uh, we could also call them stakeholders, uh, but that takes in a broader swath of people who have some uh, vested interest in how the organization performs, including oh, suppliers or people who purchase business-to-business -business relationships who want the organization to be well uh, well run. Those, they may also be considered stakeholders, but not necessarily principals. And then we have the other part of the dyad, agents. And these are people who are paid by the principal to perform a job on their behalf. In other words, the agents receive money. Uh, the relationship you most often hear about in the news with respect to this would be uh, athletes or artists who have agents. Uh, the athlete will have an agent who goes out and negotiates their contract for them with the team. Uh, the agent may also be responsible for negotiating things like marketing arrangements with, oh, say Nike if you're Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan. Uh, the agent will manage all of that and they typically get paid a fee. And as part of a way to reward or incentivize them, that fee is generally a percent of the person's take. So an agent works for the principal under that uh, set of structures. The other thing that agents are typically doing is any task that a principal is not capable of doing for themselves. You might even think about your simple mechanic who's working on your car as being an agent. Why did you hire a mechanic? Well, it was something you couldn't do for yourself. You didn't have the skill, and the agent is acting as a mechanic in this instance instance. And this gave rise to something called a mechanic's lien. So when an agent, the mechanic in this instance, works on your car, they get to hold on to your car until you pay them as a lien on their services. Uh, agency theory has a number of problems, and that number is greater than two, I can assure you. Uh, but for purposes of this uh, lecture, we'll just talk about the two. Uh, main ones that you often hear about and that cause great disconsternation in our society. Uh, the conflicting goals of principals and agents. 
along with the difficulty of principles to monitor agents. You see already there's actually two things within item one here. Uh, in other words, the principles want to maximize the revenue that comes into the company. Agents typically want to maximize their own take and how much they get paid as either a percent. And you'll see that they will engage in differential behaviors. Uh, the big thing you see these days is quarterly stock reports. What is the stock price? Agents get paid on the stock price, whereas principals are mostly interested in the overall value of the company. And those two, believe it or not, are all not as tightly linked as we might hope. The second item is the different attitudes and preferences towards risk of the principals and agents. Uh, you may have heard the expression, betting with house money. Well, that's what the uh, agents are typically doing. In other words, they may be willing to take on more risk for the company in order to get a higher stock price or short-term reward than the principals might otherwise desire. And who's in charge of reconciling these issues for the shareholders and the agents, in this case the management of a company, and that is the board of directors. And they have, and here's where the big words come out, the fiduciary duty to ensure the company is run consistently with the long-term interest of the owners or shareholders of that corporation, and they're going to act as the intermediary between them and the management. So what are they doing? They're setting up the reward and incentive systems for the managers, by and large. Uh, it used to be that the board of directors was largely held harmless for the acts of corporations. However, Sarbanes-Oxley and another uh, raft of lawsuits and legislative agendas have put the board of directors more directly at uh, risk for what happens within the companies and responsibility. In other words, you may actually see some criminal charges brought against boards of directors in the future. And this becomes very challenging for the financial part or subcommittees of the board who have to attest to the uh, veracity of the financial statements that a company is putting out. And that's why companies often hire uh, third-party accounting firms to come in and, guess what, audit the firm so that the board of directors has somebody else who's doing that work for them, yet another agent, by the way. So you can imagine how... When an accounting company, uh, say Arthur Anderson, which no longer exists, was selling both consulting and auditing services through the management, how that might play out. So the new rules for directors. So what are some of the issues? Again, I talked about it. Pay. The first thing is you've got to figure out how to compensate the CEO. Uh, Activist investors already draw upon this, and they're, they're very interested in making sure that the incentives and how CEOs get paid matters. Uh, recent legislation has tried to move it so that a lot of the rewards that managers get are deferred into later periods than they've traditionally been, trying to bring that time frame aspect of conflict into alignment by making sure it's the long-term interest that motivates both managers and shareholders. Uh, suggestions, knowing the math. Uh, this is where I'll point out a strange phenomena. It didn't used to be required that senior management would have their pay made public. And when it first occurred, uh, managers, CEOs in, in particular, salaries jumped way up. In other words, when they saw what the highest paid people were getting paid, everybody wanted that. And it's actually had some unintended consequences in that respect, and probably not to, in the best interest of the uh, shareholders. Uh, strategy. Uh, boards have generally delegated this to the management again. The CEO, somebody has to keep the vision and it's often been the CEO and that's why a lot of times you'll see CEO and chairman of the board, chairperson of the board, tied together. Uh, more and more we're seeing boards get involved. Financials, I mentioned that briefly. Crisis management. How are the board of directors getting involved when crises arrive? And we're seeing more and more of that. The other thing you're seeing is shareholder activism. Uh, this is where large blocks of shareholders go and try to get the organization to change its behavior. Uh, and sometimes these activities diverge from the maximization of wealth 
that one of my favorite economists once said is the sole purpose of uh, the corporation. I'll give you an example of this from my personal life. Uh, I went to Cornell University as an undergraduate uh, in the early 1980s, and at that time, many students and even alumni were socially active, and they were very interested in putting an end to apartheid, or that the South African system of governance where uh, black people were oppressed uh, and didn't have the rights and privileges of the white people who lived there. Uh, and so what did these students start to, to do? They asked Cornell, which has a very large endowment, uh, multi-billions of dollars, to divest from companies that did business in South Africa. And they would go around and chant, what do we want? divestment, when do we want it now? And I thought, you know, at the time, I knew enough about economics and finance that, you know, even if Cornell divested from some of the big companies that were doing business there, Coca-Cola, for example, that that wouldn't be enough of a dent uh, in Coca-Cola's business to actually get them out of South Africa. However, the message of uh, in and of itself, when Cornell finally decided to do it, uh, and other, they weren't in it by themselves by any means, by the way, uh, several other large pension funds and universities that had big endowments and ownership in these shares uh, moved out of this. And even though all of it put together shouldn't have been enough to influence these companies, it in fact did. And it wasn't the sole mechanism for ending apartheid by any means. Uh, we certainly have to give credit to the people who were there on the ground uh, living it and fighting it day to day in, in their own lives, but uh, it did contribute in, in a more powerful way than I would have expected. And we see that sort of shareholder activism occurring again today. One example is the people who manage my retirement, TIA CREF, uh, and they talk about the principles for their stock in executive compensation. So when they go out and buy stocks in companies, they want to make sure that this is the mechanism by which the executives in those companies are being rewarded and incentivized. And they can actually move the market. Kreft's a big uh, shareholder. All right, that ends part five. I'll be back with you in just a moment to talk about external control, and hopefully that will bring us full circle back to our introductory example of uh, IHI and CMS triple aims, etc.